Pilar, Mora, it's like um, more or less like me, Andrea. Come from the Izquierda Unida, from the. Is that a tradition or are you working in Izquierda Unida? No, in Izquierda Unida. In Izquierda Unida. And uh, on my right, on my left side, uh, Salvatore Prinzi, uh, one of the promoters of the Poderan Popolo, that is a new list presented in, in Italy. So, <laughs> I don't spend any time to introduce the, the argument, but I want to give directly the floor to our host, but uh, I want just to, to thank uh, Salvatore, uh, Federica and Pilar, because we are now <coughs> facing a new phase of the, 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 the construction of the left and the construction of a relation between the state and international relations uh, at the European level. And it's interesting to have these two experiences in order to understand how Spain and now Italy are facing this debate that we just start uh, uh, at the beginning of our session. So, uh, I give the floor to Federico, just to start. Hello. Thank you, it's a great pleasure being here with all of you. Um, I made some notes and I was really wondering what to tell you about um, this really exciting adventure we've been living for, for, to see for two years. So I, I've decided to organize my, my words um, in such a way uh, that I like I'm going to tell the like the the story of what has been happening two years since in, in, in Spain. Just about like this uh, TV series, I don't know if you've ever watched um, How I Met Your Mother. Well, basically it's like the story of Podemos and Pedro Sanchez, so it's gonna be told coming and I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up some some interesting uh, thing like consequences and conclusions that might be of interest for, for um, strategic radical left agenda. I was also wondering if, um, like, I was wondering if, if I could really find two metaphors to explain um, things that are important for uh, for our strategy. The first is um, thinking that uh, only like uh, a bunch of Marxists would stand, stay put here with this fantastic weather outside. I mean, this is something which which really think about uh, the relations between desire and and then the left. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's something we really have to reconsider. It's really incredible. We only guys can, can do these things. Um, I was thinking really about a metaphor that could explain what's happened with uh, politics in Spain. And I think the, um, the, the metaphor that suits better for this is, is to be trying to explain politics in four years times with the um, general theory of, of relativity. You see why I chose this metaphor is because mainly um, it explains gravity it's a disorder of, of big, uh, big, intense objects which transform space and time. Uh, that could really sum up what has happened with Podemos and, and its coalitions, also with Izquierda Unida. What has happened in Spanish politics since then, it has been uh, a huge and dense element that has, that has transformed relations with the parties and between the actors. Of course, we would have liked to be a black hole and to suck up all, all the dark matter, all the energy to transform time and space. But since we have not done this yet, we can say we, we are modulating time and space uh, among, among the actors we are, uh, we are interacting with. And um, I was also trying to, like, to explain what has happened, to bring up some conclusions, uh, organizing the periods since we entered first elections. And uh, I, I tried like to, to, to establish two different, two different um, times. The first one I, I call um, the time of the, of the mortal sin of the left of Podemos. That's from December uh, 2015 to, to, to June 2016. And this um, basically sums up what happened uh, with Podemos uh, not uh, obeying the orders uh, of voting a really uh, tremendous uh, government between Podemo, between Ciudadanos and, and, and PSOE. And the second part I'm going to, I'm going to try to explain is what I call like um, waiting for the dot or I can get no satisfaction, which is the, the time where we came to second elections until now, 
where uh, we have uh, managed to to uh, get rid of the corrupt, most corrupt government of, of, of Europe. Um, I also wanted to start saying that we have good news. I mean, uh, things are not bad. I mean, last, last time I saw you, I could, I could tell that uh, we, now we're better. We're better because the field of politics is open. And when the field of politics is open, it's, it's better for us because we can do politics. We can transform things, huge or not, but we can uh, escape from the fatalistic, undeterministic point of view where we just talk to ourselves. So um, I'm a bit optimistic about what's happening now in Spain. But I'm going to try to bring up all the um, all the nuances to to explain how we should manage this optimism optimism in order not to get too burned and too easily burned. So I'm going to start uh, narrating this this uh, two years tale uh, since winter uh, first elections. So as you all perhaps know, um, on 2015 on December, um, Podemos and its coalition entered with about five million votes which meant basically we were really close to the Socialist Party in, in terms of votes. Only 200,000 votes separated us from, from the Socialist Party. Uh, and well, at that time, it seemed pretty reasonable that uh, if we were to come to terms with the Socialist Party, we would ask uh, in, in correspondence with our representation, uh, responsibilities in government, but not culture, only culture, but also defense, and no defense, but also economy. So things that really that could really balance the government. Um, that seemed really pretty, pretty reasonable, but uh, what, what we really found out is that while we were doing this with, uh, with our best wishes, uh, Socialist Party was having uh, parallel uh, meetings and encounters with the Ciudadanos, which was the, um, the, like the, the economy's uh, favorite at the time, and they were handling a, a government uh, agreement that was run by two guys which were really well known to us. One is uh, Garicano, who's a former member of, um, of the LSE, Long School of Economics. He was my teacher, so um, I know him well. Also, um, also uh, Jordi Sevilla, who was running uh, economics for, for the Socialist Party. And I mean, you have to check backgrounds because it's nice to see what, what, who these people are. I mean, you can tell uh, what's happening by um, looking to their resumes. And this guy was like offering to Price Waterhouse uh, assessment on how to make better evictions uh, during the during the hardest time of families and and migrants in Spain. So that was like to really point out what was the situation at that moment, uh, why why we had like uh, to give it some thought if we were going to support or not this kind of agreement. Um, well, it ended up um, having three three different approaches, which are. Um, Three approaches where I'm going to describe because they're, they're strategic and they're really paradigmatic on how we do things on the left many times. So when we had to like all decide on, on what we were going to do with uh, with this uh, situation, with the agreement that uh, we had to refrain, that we had to vote for a socialist party in order not to commit this mortal sin of not voting for a socialist president and letting the right wing party uh, be on power or go to, to elections again, we had to Basically, three different approaches on this. We had the traditional leftist approach that um, thought that the worse, the better. And we know this, let's not work like this, but it was, it was there. So it was like something like, let them have it. Let them uh, cook themselves up. The, the socialist parties will un unmask itself. We go to a second round, and this second round will beat them up because they're going to be um, depicted as traitors. Well, there was one approach. Then we had also like this um, silent pragmatics on our side that wished uh, to to refrain and to vote for the for the agreement and to elect a socialist president, but um, they didn't say it too loud, too loud, too loud. So we had them like uh, really calm and they didn't speak up until uh, so it always happened in politics as things were already done and they tried to give themselves reasons why they they not do it before. And then, then came a new scenario, which is the one I totally want to talk about. It's like the new scenario approach. Uh, the most beautiful thing about why we did not, apart from the fact that the content of the, of the agreement was really bad, uh, really was really going to harm interests of social, um, of, of popular and, and working class classes. Why did we not decide in political terms, uh, as an actor, as a new actor, to, to stand by uh, what uh, Socialist Party was offering us? Is because 
things had changed. And it's a lesson hard to take because it also, as I will say and speak about it after this, um, it's a lesson which is hard to make. But things had changed and we were not the organization that, had, that was irrelevant to Spanish politics. We had entered parliament with 5 million votes. We were a really, good, really big actor. We were 2,000, uh, 100,000, 200,000 votes uh, separated from Socialist Party. So, um, well, um, we decided um, not to vote for this until, very, until the very last time, uh, until the very last second, uh, the, the socialists were really um, kind of like uh, thinking we were really bluffing. We were bluffing because how come these, these, these guys were not going to behave themselves and vote for what the mainstream media was asking them and they even invented lots of polls on this. And um, we had to really uh, speak up and decide people to choose or not this um, disagreement. And we and we did um, a voting, and it came up that we didn't want this kind of agreement. I don't see this in an optimistic terms. Uh, the result was that after that we had to go to second a second round of elections, and this time um, we had a problem. I mean, we lost one million votes. And that time we went together with Kiramira, and we must we must make some and extract some conclusions and lessons on this. Um, I think that the first one to make is that um, um, you have to keep you have to keep up with really hard decisions. Yes, you have to in order to to transform relations with uh, actors such as the Socialist Party, although they're costly. And they're costly in terms of votes, firstly because we learned that um, when you, um, when the popular class is mostly mobilized, when they see they can win. I mean, not even intellectualized uh, militants, popular classes. They go to vote, and they go to vote for an alternative when they see they can reach your expectations you're making. And if you do not, and if you do not, for whatever reasons, you get penalized really hard. Because they're, they're putting you something on the table is, you have to handle this, handle this, and if you don't, well, you get, um, you get really penalized. And um, so this is how ideology also works when you um, have to put up with uh, hard decisions. The second thing that uh, is really important is um, something we have to really tattoo in our skin. The worst is the worst. I mean, the worst is not the better. Never, ever. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see it the other way. So we have to get used to, if we want to practice radical left strategies, is to try to combine a uh, win-win scenario. I mean, we've seen too many, too many, um, uh, too many situations, too many circumstances where the worst is always turning to be to a more uh, worse scenario. So um, that's something we really came as a, as a conclusion. Um, and um, well, after after that. Um, the story goes goes on, and uh, we had the second elections with a last million votes. In terms of representations, it was pretty much the same. The reasons why uh, Socialist Party before did not opt for um, uh, a, a coalition with us and with some other forces, especially with the nationalist Catalans and Basque, was because of mathematics. They said they said the mathematics didn't make it. The, the numbers were not there, and there were red lines. Um, I mean, it's basic arithmetic. I mean, you have the numbers. I mean, I mean we have a we have a socialist government now. So I mean, I mean, that was a first lesson of mathematics. Uh, well, it was uh, something that uh, we have to read in terms of, of propaganda. I mean, if you still check on the polls, uh, on the trackings, who is to blame on why we had a second elections and why the right wing party was governing still without a majority? It was because of Podemos. It was because of Podemos. And of course, they do have uh, mainstream media to, to put forward uh, this kind of um, messages. But um, we also have to read, read it the other way in order to, to strike the proper lessons. Say, all this said, also with uh, Pedro Sanchez, uh, having said on prime time, he wouldn't uh, choose an option with Podemos because uh, basically, uh, Companies, uh, mainstream media would not allow him, allow him, allow him to make such a pact. 
So um, also some of the ironies of all this uh, uh, theory of uh, um, gravitational politics. Uh, Podemos has transformed the Socialist Party in a way they cannot even recognize themselves. Firstly, because uh, after Pedro Sanchez was kicked out after the second election, well, um, he had to, as a good tactician, he had to find out how to work things out to, to keep him in the, as a secretary general. So he appealed to the basis, and it came out that basically uh, Podemos had managed to disrupt traditional, traditional way of electing people in, in a socialist party, basically it was through El Bais, which was like until yesterday or so, like the most relevant media actor in Spain, was like pointing out who had to work things out in, in the socialist party and who didn't. But uh, then it came to the moment that that stopped being so, and that's something we can achieve as a victory for us. I mean, we, we've transformed that. After we will speak about the second victory, also related to how to, to push forward your, 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 your opponents. But the thing is, was that it was not a satisfactory uh, scenario. So this is something that we have to read it really clearly. After the second elections, although uh, being convinced that the alternative was not the best one, that namely is the government of Sanchez with Ciudadanos, the right wing party was still governing Spain um, with uh, with a majority. Of, of the people in Spain that had voted uh, bluntly against such a government. So this was not a good scenario because uh, basically popular mandate was not being represented, was not being advocated, so we had to deal with this. And we felt many times as, um, like, as like, a, um, like, like a mouse in a wheel. You see, when you like, try to go faster and faster, but you always stay at the very same place because we have majority to to, to propose laws in government, in, 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 sorry, not in government, in, in, in Congress, but uh, at the end of the day, the government would just uh, have the, what, the, the tools to, to avoid uh, being, being uh, advised by the, by the um, Congress. So it was like a very contradictory situation. So, um, so we decided like we had to, like, to uh, try to displace or interrupt such situations. We, we entered in a, uh, in a season of momentum last year and Podemos tried to, although it had no numbers, tried to disrupt the situation, uh, trying to do something we've been practicing a lot and it seems we're becoming an expert, is trying to push the Socialist Party to places they don't want to go. I mean, that's also a lesson we all know, I mean, there's no news that uh, with your opponents it's not a matter of truth or conviction, it's a matter of strength. You have to push them and push them and push them if you have the power to do so in order to, to come to the results you, you need. So um, after that, um, well, one, one day of spring, suddenly the uh, Socialist Party decided that uh, it was enough. The corruption of the government was enough, although we knew it was enough two years before. And we were glad to know that they were presenting an alternative with Pedro Sanchez and that we were going to support this no conditions attached this time, just because we thought there was a need of democratic cleansing in our institutions. Um, so it came to, to the point that we supported uh, this uh, candidacy. And here is where we, regarding like, the, the talk that, was, that we, have, we had before, where we have to also check our, um, our points of view and our approaches on, on what's happening now in Spain. No? And um, I, I tried to sum up this um, the situation in, the, in, in different approaches, also that are related to the ways of, of, of facial expression. Um, on the one hand, you have the, I mean, regarding the Socialist Party in our government, you have the left, leftist approach, traditional leftist approach, which uh, like kind of a wrinkled, uh, really angry face towards what's happening in Spain, is that what Samira was like, I told you so, the, is, the essence is being betrayed. Uh, the truth is being is being is being kept by us because what we have is um, is a grumpy uh, like a kind of grumpy um, told you so um, attitude towards uh, towards the socialist party which I know I mean it's reasonable but it has something that um, that uh, has to do with uh, what I started saying <coughs> our relation from from the radical left with uh, with pleasure it's really it's really annoying. 
uh, to tell the people when they're happy, when they're happy, and we were happy when we expelled Pedro and Maria Rajoy, to tell them, sorry, you have no reasons to be happy. I'm going to tell you you have no reasons. <laughs> so it was some, some people like uh, obnoxiously trying to uh, keep this kind of, um, of approach. There was, on the other hand, we had like this um, fatal optimistic approach <coughs> represented by this um, kind of uh, hallucinated smile also on our side where like uh, we suddenly opened a new scenario with Pedro Sanchez and the Socialist Party had transformed itself and a uh, new path for socialism and transformation is going to come up. Come on. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. <laughs> We know who, we know these guys for a long time. I mean, we, we know who they are. I mean, it's fine. I mean, I mean, it's uh, family relations. I mean, we know them for sure. And all those, although uh, we know for sure, some people uh, had this necessary, like necessity of um, of opening up after a traumatic two-year times of right in um, uh, really corrupt governments. It's our also our duty to like to keep it low. And, Try to not overestimate what's happening. And on the other side, I mean, there's like a third way I like to, to see as a way on how to handle things with the Socialist Party now is basically the, the kid comes and, and, like, and let's make the most of a really, really weak government. And this is your point. We can make the most because we have the relate, correlation of power in order to transform things. And in order to do this, we have to use a poker face. I mean, that's what I would do. Uh, just Stay, stay cool, let's see what's happening. Um, play our cards um, in order to see what we, can, what we can transform. There's things that are being transformed in, all, in over the one month. We're not expecting miracles, but we think um, we really need to find a strategy to, to cope uh, with kind of these kind of situations in a way which is not uh, the old grumpy leftist point of view of keeping the essence and the truth. Or uh, the other experience is like giving giving it away and just disappearing as an actor. So we um, we have to really try to to find a way of capitalizing victories inside our own correlations of power. And that's that's really uh, alchemy. It's not simple. I mean, there's no guidelines on this. There's no handbook on how to do this. But I mean, if we make the numbers and uh, mathematics imposes to politics, we know that. Uh, by our own strength, we're really transforming things. So uh, we have to to think in strategic terms, you know, that not to not to throw social democracy, what's left of it in Spain, to the arms of the radical centrists. You see those guys, which are always uh, well centered. So it's it's really difficult. I mean, uh, I was thinking of how to express this, but uh, perhaps our colleagues in Portugal have been managing also with the same situation. Um, but we're like trying to think how can we really um, how can we really uh, uh, work things out in a field of competition, um, amplifying and widening uh, the, the field for progressive forces, and also pushing really hard when we see a really frightened socialist party that is not willing to to take a step forward. Uh, for me, I mean, it's really important to see that uh, determinism and determinic politics are over. I mean, one plus one is no longer two in Spanish politics. I mean, um, it, it was really nice to see uh, all these really uh, intellectual um, advisors not knowing what to say on, on, on scenarios because they're really wide open, and that's good news. I mean, open scenarios where we can influence with politics are good scenarios. Uh, we have to overcome, and we, I think, in, in Spain, we've been doing this for a while. We, we're trying to, like, uh, not to fear uh, contradictions. I mean, Podemos has been doing that for a while. I mean, we're uh, pure contradictions in ourselves. And it's really important that we, we don't get frightened uh, when, the, when all these possibilities come up. Um, and, um, well, there, there's some other, um, some other conclusions I wanted to point it out. Um, I think it's time for radical politics. I do really believe so. Um, the, only, the only thing it's important is to reframe radical politics. I mean, the way we do them. Before we heard some things on, 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 the, on our colleague from, from Bloco, who was saying there's two major mistakes. One, once when you like, do not push forward enough and because you are on the, on the vanguard of things and people do not follow you, or you don't uh, put forward things because you're too timid and people are ready on a place and you don't want to go there because you are frightened. 
Well, I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed with tracking, so I'm obsessed with reading polls and qualitative uh, investigations. And you would really not believe how well prepared many of our uh, companies and citizens in Spain, how are they prepared to go forward with things such as the Republic? Yes, of course. But how? The Republic as, as for the Second Republic? No. New Republic? Yes. And that means we have to reframe radical politics. Is the Republic is the Republic in Spain something radical? Yes, it is. Uh, but the thing is how to, to reframe it. I mean, the, the field of, of symbols there is wide open. Um, also, the, with our relations with the, with the monarchy, I mean, it will be radical politics and we have to really think it through uh, how to get rid of this institution. It would be a matter of our political intelligence, of our political intelligence on how we manage to get rid of, of this institution. Uh, and there I'm glad to say that the, the field is open. We can, we can have a chance of uh, reinventing um, victories for our side uh, in a situation when, where we can uh, create a win-win situation and it's going to ask us for a really, really deep in intelligence, strategic intelligence to, to, to make it through. Um, and there's something also that I want to express and I think this is also kind of um, um, something that really I've been giving it some thought on, on visualizing campaigns and, and the way um, left-wing uh, and radical left express itself. Um, we cannot stay in a, in a moment of, of pure um, opposition and silence. We have to offer not a watered-down, not, not the true version of social democracy when social democracy is a watered-down watered version of itself. We need to, you know, you need to offer a mm, tremendously innovative picture of what we want to do. I mean, we have to be capable of giving that image, otherwise, otherwise we risk being just uh, an adulterated or a better version of something which no longer exists. And that means basically trying to think things out on, on the, for example, a kind of a new modernity. Uh, in the past it was, called, it was called progress, but I mean, there's, there's things that are, are calling us to, to, be, to be thematized. Basically, things that in town such as Madrid or Barcelona, they have started to, to work out, uh, and they, I think they're really important. Um, digitalization, we have to offer alternatives through digital industries. We have to impose new, new vision that uh, can use uh, technology as a transformative, so, trans transformative and solidarity in a solidaristic manner. And that's something that uh, we should came from for our, for our side. And uh, not only by denouncing things such as Uber and Gamify and uh, Airbnb, which we do, of course we do, but we have to offer alternatives. And we are, we're capable of doing this. I mean, and the resources needed to do this, it's, it's, it's uh, sometimes ridiculous. It would really be amazing to show the figures, for, for example, the, all the social economy corporations, all the cooperatives that have grown up with municipal initiatives in Barcelona. I mean, this is building a new field. And what we really think is that uh, the, most radical, the most radical politics done in Spain now is done in Tangos. So the new Spain is, is now being built in, in Barcelona, in Zaragoza, in, in Madrid. Those are our radical politics right now. And I think uh, if, we manage, if we manage to translate this success uh, into the whole country, we will be in a much better situation. Um, and that's something really, that really has to be taken uh, into consideration. I just wanted to finish uh, by pointing out, because we are in a European level, uh, things that are going on um, on the European context, um, and of course, I mean, it's no, no, nothing if I say that uh, Europe is in really dire straits. I mean, we are facing basically a Macron-Merkel axis that's being opposed, opposed by extreme right parties. Basically, uh, Le Pen's having a solution. I mean, this is disastrous. This is disastrous. I mean. Uh, if, if it comes out on the next European elections that we have let the extreme right be the leading opposition in Europe, and I mean we should really like uh, close down the business. I mean we have we have we have eight months time, seven months time to to really give it a thought. Really give it a thought. I'm gonna put it really bluntly, 
Uh, I don't care about uh, which platform, I don't care about which uh, decoration, but we have to give it some thought. The, uh, we would be handling things really, really wrong if it comes up that the results let the extreme right be the opposition to the authoritarian um, Europe. Of course, um, I mean, showing that uh, neoliberalism um, and, um, and racism and, and xenophobia is basically the same side of, the, of one coin is something that's really easy to say, but really difficult to translate in political terms. Um, and um, it's time we stop talking about migration, I think. Stop talking about migration. Let's start talking about poverty. We many times say, let's put forward the social agenda. But the social agenda needs a context. And that context is yet to be found. I mean, there's no frame, there's no proper frame now to talk about these things. Uh, every time we talk about migration, I have the this strange feeling that the extreme right parties are just getting really excited, really excited. So let's turn it up, let's turn it upside down. Let's try to rethink migration, to use some other frame in order to not let them uh, do this really good agenda setting they've been doing for quite a while. And here we, I think we're going to measure ourselves. Uh, we have to stand up uh, for, for these elections and um, is going to be quite challenging, but I'm sure that there's um, there's quite a lot of intelligence in this room. There's lots of intelligence in the European left. There's things that are being transformed and they're seeing transformation, and uh, we're going to be able to to find that uh, find that new, new paths to to cope with things. Uh, I hope I have not bored you too much. I wanted to, to just express this short tale of uh, what happened in Spain in these two year really exciting and exhausting times. Uh, I don't know you, but uh, I've been, I've, I've grown all this gray hair in two years time. <laughs> Politics is really, really bad for one's health and uh, same time it's exciting, but really exhausting. Um, um, and no, I just wanted to end up thanking, thank you all for, for the invitation. It's been great to be here, thank you. I propose to stay in Spain, so we have the, the other ring, and uh, Milan, of course, we miss also the Catalan question, and maybe some words on uh, how, this, how was now the situation in Catalan, and it would be uh, useful for us. Okay. Well, I'll do my best. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the Letting me be here, I'm um, quite glad. And um, well, uh, in order not to repeat uh, what Federico was saying, um, I think it, it's good uh, or a little healthy to try to put everything in context uh, because the Spanish situation is not only, uh, not only has an explanation and a uh, self development, but it's also explained uh, in a particular world stage uh, at the European times, what's happening in politics right now, and well, uh, particularly now, we are in times where effect effectively uh, right-wing uh, parties and policies everywhere all over the world are coming around uprising in a particular context and like well like he said uh, with migration uh, labels to the conflicts uh, with words that imperialism has fabricated themselves and particularly in crisis contexts is as a, is, it is that the monsters come that the monsters are created I mean we've heard Gramsci talking about this many many times and uh, well specifically, uh, I think it's interesting to, as Marxists maybe, uh, try to analyze what, what's the situation, not only uh, for this time that we're living, we're all living uh, worldwide, but specifically to know how this develops and how it takes place in each place we, we have to dispute, uh, we have to build politics. Uh, because this context is only a framework, but the history doesn't repeat itself. Uh, I mean, we can get leads on some things, we can uh, use it like a very useful tool, 
but it won't give us answers. It's, uh, it's us who have to make them, to have to elaborate those answers. So, uh, well, specifically, uh, what this, uh, where this takes us in Spain, particularly, is to make a, a quite precise a diagnostic on what's our situation. How did we come here? And specifically, well, what's this, our economy structure? What's the power? Uh, where is the power in Spain? Uh, who are these people that are in the government? And um, are disguised like uh, in a political party, in this case the BP I'm talking about, not the new government, uh, but well, these are more like businessmen than uh, political people. So, well, in this case in particular, um, I think the structure uh, is one of the main issues we have in Spain. Uh, one thing you can easily tell uh, is a precarization, life's precarization that was brought with neoliberalism uh, has, has the expression right now uh, in the works, in the jobs people have. Uh, we, are, we were trending each time more to have uh, not really precarized but uh, low wages jobs only in the areas, in the service areas and their economy has taken slowly uh, our future away from our youngest, for example. We have an immigration uh, number that is scary, it's really scary. Uh, I'm in the exterior area, particularly in Esquerda Unida, and it's really sad to say that we're growing so much because we keep and keep and keep on having uh, Spanish women and men and boys and girls out of Spain because they can make a live uh, in Spain. They can get a job, they can study. Um, it's a particular situation in which we have to think politics, I think. And this introduction, I think, gives me a, a little bit more of comfort to, to get exactly where we're trying to go. Uh, well, in this case, with all of this scenario that has different levels too. I mean, we have uh, to analyze many things, not only the economies, not, not only the structural things, but, only, uh, but also how our society is in many terms, social concerns, like for example, gender, gender equality. Uh, well, we are in the middle of the fourth feminist wave uh, in the world, and we are all so excited about about this. Women are so empowered, and we are so excited about this. But that's a reality. Uh, when progressive movements come, the reaction and the counter revolution comes worse. And for example, in many of these countries, when we were in the main cities and countries where feminist struggles take place, it's where the femicides. Uh, rates have grown the most and it's not something strange, it's not something weird, it's perfectly easy to explain that and that's the counter-reaction uh, that every process has. So, in this particular uh, in this particular time we're having, uh, it's us who have to create a new politics, a new policy that uh, can handle all of this new stuff coming up. Uh, and well, as, uh, as a political party, we have to adapt to that too, because not only uh, it's not the same political subject that uh, remains the same along history, but it's it's particularly changing now. Uh, I mean, precarization of life is something that has grown so constantly in the last decades that, look for example, the relationship between our grandparents uh, our grandparents with uh, their jobs, with their houses. Look at the relationship of our parents with their houses, relationships and jobs, and look at ours. We look like nomads <laughs> nowadays. Uh, but, well, given this, we have to think and build our political subject. Uh, and we have to adapt to that. We can be conservative and look at the past and say, oh, I want to get there when life was solid and secure and safe, because it was another context and that makes you conservative. Uh, but we have to really start to think on the new paradigm we're trying uh, to build, because if we don't have a clear paradigm 
to build, uh, and we don't focus on our political subject and try to build it, we're not going to be able to represent anyone. Not only not building an alternative, uh, but we're not going to be able to transmit what we want. We have to rethink what we want, I think. It's what I'm thinking right now. And in, well, given this, we have a very particular situation uh, in Spain with uh, the government change uh, that is quite a new scenario uh, for what the last years have been. And given this, I think you have uh, what we're trying to do actually is to try to adapt to this. Uh, there are so, it's more like fragmented the, um, the public interests uh, and the public concerns that if you have just one agenda, you can't get everywhere. Uh, I mean, the figure of the political party sometimes isn't enough uh, because there are different movements that are not so easy to, to lead or are not so easy to follow either. Uh, for example, the first femini uh, feminist wave is one of those examples. I mean, there are many feminists that we would like to lead in a feminine, in an interpretation of feminism that is more close to ours, uh, but it's not that simple, and it's not maybe uh, it's not the only way we have of leading that uh, inside our party because it won't be enough. So, in this political movements and social movements that we see that are in society. Uh, it's not that we should create this. this. This particular activism exists is there. The concerns are there. So what, um, what, what is your task now is to adapt our figures and our policies in order to be that where we want, uh, in order to build this new paradigm we are trying to get, in order to have I mean, it's not like we don't have our very clear principles on many things. Uh, we want gender equality. We want gender equality everywhere. We want gender equality in politics. We want gender equality in jobs, in the houses, in the caring policies that no government takes care of almost in the whole world. Uh, and there are many other things, not only jobs, like dignity, jobs that get you, make, make it might let you have a, a life, a quiet life, a calm life. Um, there are different things, not only the economic development, uh, the health system, the education, the education system. Um, we have a very, very, very old debt in Spain uh, with our memory policies. We have streets with name of genocides. Uh, we are one of the few countries of the very uh, these countries that remain without judging, uh, it's, genocide, it's genocides, it's fascist leaders. Uh, and it's terrible, it's, it's a terrible impact that you might see in society of that. Uh, I, for example, live in Argentina right now uh, that has had its trials against its genocides, and society changes so much through that. Something that's as simple as that. Uh, but well, that's not the old debt we have. So there are so many clear things we know we want, but we have to try to figure all that together to know which are political subjects and subjects are, because uh, we do activism in many uh, places, not in many territories, but in many institutions as well, like universities, for example. Um, and well, in, in this task, uh, it is uh, the fear of the political movement, particularly in Spain, is becoming, or at least it promised to become, is promising to become uh, a useful tool. So, well, it's a particular, the particular time we're living uh, in, like Federico said, in a time where people uh, have hope. Not hope specifically in Pedro Sanchez, and hope in that finally something could change. Uh, Mariano Rajoy had to leave the government. He was, I mean, uh, it's something that has never happened before in Spain's history. Uh, the, 
the motion de censura, I can't find the words in English for that, I was thinking about that, uh, is something that had never, uh, was never achieved in, in, this, in Spanish history. So in a particular context of change, uh, well, we have to figure how to, how, how to use this new scenario to get where we want to get. Um, there's a, uh, an Antonio Gramsci phrase that I like very much, I quoted some of it like a bit ago, but it's a phrase that consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new can be born. Well, I think this is precisely the political time we're having in Spain and this, and this is that the new uh, not only hasn't been born yet, but it is, it is our task to make it born, to help it be born. And particularly in the about the Catalonia conflict, uh, well, I think all of us know or are aware of the, the treatment that Mariano Rajoy's government had given to the conflict uh, with brutal, brutal repression on the, on the I can find the word for plebiscito, <laughs> but uh, referendum, that's it. Um, but in this particular issue, there are many things that uh, come as a discussion right now because of the context. I mean, the, when you see the, the Spanish police being sent by Mariano Rajoy, uh, fighting and hitting and repressing people in Catalonia, uh, it's very clear for everyone uh, which side you will choose. But the particular situation of such an oppressive policy, we have a monarchy in Spain. Uh, in 2018, we have a monarchy. Uh, we have uh, Mordaza laws that are basically uh, laws that can let you treat anything against, uh, against the government, the, the, the royalty, uh, anything is used to say, oh, you're, uh, that's a terrorism allegory and chasing uh, political, not only political, I mean, it's not only put them on. Uh, there's a rap singer that had to leave Spain because he was going to go to jail because of a song. Um, it's, it's a quite important situation and it's quite great. Uh, but this, this particular circumstance leads to the discussion of Catalonia very, uh, very short. I think, uh, because the real discussion we would like to have about, uh, well, Catalonia, and not only Catalonia, uh, we have uh, Euskadi, we have Galicia, we have, there's, uh, all, there's so many uh, autonomic, not autonomic communities that have tried to leave Spain or fought for that for centuries, that I can't even count them, uh, but uh, what, what is our dream of country, what we would fight for, what we really want uh, is a plurinational uh, federal republic uh, with everyone in, uh, in a democratic system. That's what we would want. The thing is, the current situation of Catalonia is not, an, uh, it's not a dichotomy between or the dichotomy be between uh, living or staying in a a uh, plurinational republic uh, where they have real democracy and can participate in the government's decision like it should be in a federal system. Uh, the particular condition in which that uh, discussion takes place is uh, to remain inside the uh, Spanish monarchy state uh, with very particular economic struggles specifically uh, or well, independence, but all is, is something that you have to value to. There's a very, very deep economical crush of interest too um, for when you discuss Catalonian independence. So, well, the situation right now is, uh, is quite complex because of that. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen specifically after the government has changed. We truly hope uh, that Pedro Sanchez uh, will uh, will deal differently 
with this very same circumstance. Uh, that's not certain so far, but uh, I, I, I really wanted to put in context that the, the disjunctive we're discussing right now about Catalonia is not the one we would like to be discussing. Uh, we would like to be thinking of a new, because we need it, we need a new project, not only of living situation country, uh, we really need to discuss our whole country's structure and our whole country's political system, uh, because we have many communities uh, that, and many nations that live inside uh, Spain and that hasn't been recognized. Uh, I mean, Catalan language, was prohibited by not only or oh, like not only like 500 years ago uh, it was prohibited it, like <laughs> 50 years ago with Franco it's so short ago so you when you see that you really you really realize that uh, either you recognize the nations that live in a very same state like many countries do for example Bolivia has an I think that's the best, best example for me of a plurinational state that recognizes the nations inside it. Uh, and that's what we want. We will fight for it. Uh, but well, we know the particular discussion that Catalonia is having right now, it's not that one. That is our paradigm and our paradigm, but particularly uh, in the discussion that, there's, that is taking place right now. Well, uh, everyone knows which side you're on. But um, it's a real sad. Um, it's a real sad thing that we all we're only discussing. Not we maybe, but the media only discuss and the Germanic uh, speech is only discussing whether if you get an independence or if Catalonia remains in Spain by force. It's uh, that's I think the, one of the things that annoys me the most at least. But well, hope not to have more to you too. Uh, as well, and thank you very much again for the invitation. I'm really glad I, I can be here representing Scalonia. Thank you. So now we will collect the question afterward, and then because also me, I had the opportunity to, to visit Madrid and Barcelona many times, so. I, I'm the first on the list of our questions. <laughs> oh, please. I'm so sick and tired of speaking about, of speaking about Catalonia that I always try like, to forget about it. So that's, that's why I have not spoken about Catalonia. Also because I, I'm not going to express here my opinion. I think uh, Jacobin revolutions were done in the 18th century. and They were badly done in the case of Spain. So we have to cope with what we have to cope with. Um, that being said, um, two lessons for um, politics towards popular classes. Who won on this conflict? Let's, let's check the results. Ciudadanos. Ciudadanos is the major and larger force in Catalonia. Okay, some other uh, conclusion. Podemos, the first time when we were to dispute Catalan elections. We were obsessed on not speaking about the national thing. But people were conversing about the national thing all the time. They were speaking about it all the time. So, I mean, for, perhaps for you it's, it's obvious for us, what's not so obvious at the time, is that uh, you can try uh, not to speak about what's being spoken. <laughs> but <laughs> it's worthless. I mean, that also happens side, sideways with the social agenda. So, you want to speak about the Catalan question, or let's speak about the social agenda. So we went to Catalonia and started speaking about uh, universal income, about uh, evictions, about all that. You know, all the polemo stuff. Uh, and people were like, oh, I don't give a fuck. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so it's, the thing is that, okay, let's try to reframe things. Uh, when I'm, I'm, I'm pushing on this is because uh, we don't have the power enough in order to change the agenda still. So we are, we're distorting time and space because we're, we're a big object. But we do not change time and space. So many times for us, in order to do that kind of politics, also when we address popular classes, we have to be really, really tremendously um, pay tremendous attention to what the what the people are telling us, and that's that's uh, that we should take as an obsession. Hear what the people are saying to us, what they're wanting, what they're asking for, what their needs, what they're otherwise it's really sometimes confusing 
desires with real reality, and the results in Catalonia are evident. Popular classes went special, specifically, uh, they made a really tremendous discovery. Catalan independence discovered that there's a Spanish political subject that exists on Catalonia, which had never ever manifested before, namely 31% of the electorate. That's quite a lot. That's quite a lot. So we have a lot to reconsider on what has happened. I'm on your side that, of course, we, I mean, it has been democratic rights that have been neglected for long. But uh, if I have to like uh, see the overall result, I would say it's a disaster. It's a big mess. It's a big mess. Especially for popular classes in Spain. For popular classes in Catalonia also. Let's ask our Catalan colleagues, and we should do that, and we should do that. Our left Catalan colleagues that have been supporting a right-wing government for too long. Too long. That's a, not a really comfortable question to make. No, it's not. But we should make it. We should make it. I mean, and with Walter, uh, identities should never go uh, aside from uh, other kind of discussions, of course, but we have to reformulate the, the way we do things. Otherwise, sometimes we enter these really huge traps where afterwards it's really difficult to get out of them. And that has happened in Catalonia, that has happened in Spain, happened to the Socialist Party supporting uh, central government, happened to the Catalan independence supporting a corrupt right-wing party. So uh, it's time to, to settle things down and to find common ground, because we do have a common ground. And we are we're searching that in, inside the really variable geometry we have in Spain to push forwards in, in, in Parliament. And we will see that, and it's probably now political fiction, but I'm, I think we'll, we'll be able to uh, reconstruct what has been broken by coming to agreements with things that are social, that are really important to us too. So I, I hope I'm also going to be a bit optimistic, especially because uh, we are tired of speaking about Catalonia. So I hope it comes to an end whatsoever result, but really it's um, something that has really dominated the agenda for, for too long. Just something I forgot to say. I, I thought you were like one minute amazing, and I said, "What did I talk about that I had planned to talk?" I will I will be brief about that. But we were just talking about how we got here and what our situation was like. But we didn't talk much about what we are tr going to do uh, from so on with a government, with a new government. We haven't said much about that because uh, I mean the votes were there, uh, but well, what's our situation in that? very same uh, situation and well I mean it, it depends on what the government uh, policy becomes uh, in every time in, in every particular government decision and public policy that they take uh, if it's a progressive one if it gives rights to people if it uh, focuses on redistribution or recognition we will support it uh, from an opposition, a left wing opposition. Uh, well, if it's not, if it's regressive, uh, we will, uh, probably said, oppose. But, but it's a new stage when I think this this probability that we see this possibility of supporting some particular policies is a whole new thing uh, in Spain because we weren't having that for many years. Uh, it's I mean, we have to see. Uh, no one knows what's going to happen. There are some signs that some uh, policies uh, will be uh, worth to support, uh, like memory, for example, policies. Uh, everything tends to seem at least that there will be uh, good, um, good intentions at least of the Sanchez government. Uh, but well, uh, I think the economical part will be the harder one <laughs> to support. But it's a new stage, and well, let's see what happens. We don't know either. Thanks. No, it's just it. Yes, as I said, we we have the question after, and that's what we have time to discuss other questions that, that we didn't rise now. But now I want to go to Italy, my country, and uh, first of all we apologize because we ask also to other uh, political forces uh, of the left area, so-called left area, uh, but 
uh, unfortunately, no one not from Liberia uh, Wali could come. So maybe next time we will have also an other's point of view. But now we have uh, the opportunity to have Pogere uh, Alpomo uh, with us. And so I give the floor to. <coughs> Thank you, thank you so much for this invitation. And Salvatore Prinzi, <laughs> present myself. No, I have to explain because I, I, I used to call him Sazo, but uh, since this is a nickname, I don't want to. <laughs> Sorry, it's not because you are getting old with your No, no. Not yet. Not, not yet. Not so long. So thanks to Angelina to have printed uh, the paper. Probably you've seen you've seen it on the table. And um, to Rosa and Roberto because they're trying really to uh, uh, bring in Italy a little bit of discussion about uh, Europe because, as you know, in Italy, foreign affairs and all European questions are very, very, very less evaluated by even by the activists. Uh, I think moments like this one where we can discuss and debate are very important, especially for us Italians. Uh, we, we heard a lot about Spain, there you can see a very good uh, situation, a difficult situation, but an open wide situation. In Italy it seems just <laughs> completely the, the, the opposite. I mean, you, we, we have a very difficult situation and it seems that Italy is like the, uh, a dark hole of the left in Italy. So for us it's very important to come, to come here and to learn from your experience uh, because you have succeeded in involving masses and we want to learn because we want to do the same. We are aware that now we have to resist in this moment but uh, we know that class struggle in Italy in this moment is continuing and it is arising in many different ways. I believe that populism that we see now in Italy, it, it, it's of course it's kind of answer to, uh, to the class struggle on a, on a political stage. And our ruling classes now are not able to give an effective answer to the political and economic crisis. This is especially true for Italian government, but made by two populist right-wing forces, which cannot solve the contradiction that broke out in the last 10 years of economic crisis. Therefore, we are sure that we will be plenty of opportunities in the following month to voice these comforting problems the people are suffering and to become a mass movement. In order to do so, we know that we have to improve our analytical, quantitative, organizational level. We can do this with your support. For this reason, in my opinion, this seminar is not only a moment of discussion. For us, it's an important political act. It's a brick that we are laying down in our political group. Now, to achieve this result and to have feedback and advice by you, I decided to, div to divide my speech into three parts. Uh, first of all, I will try to sum up the Italian political, social and economic situation, very briefly. Then I will tell the history and the path of Potera Popolo. Of course, it's not uh, a very well-known force, so probably you can be interested in knowing something as an answer to this political scenario. And lastly, I will try to clarify what we want to do in the forthcoming months about the building of our organization, about mass mobilization, and about our position in the European scenario. So we can start with the first part, the Italian situation. As you know, I go very quickly because you are very well experienced, but I try to sum up some points. Italy is one of the European countries where the economic crisis of 2008 had the worst consequences. Under, there is a scheme about the flotation of the GDP. As you can see, after the crisis of 2008 and the following slight increase during 2011, there was another crisis related to national debt. So after 10 years, Italy has not reached the economic levels it had before 2008. Even when there was opportunity for international recovery, our country achieved the worst result. And what is worst? 
even when we had growth in the last year, very less growth, but growth, this wealth was not redistributed. Why? <clears throat> Why we had these two crises and the worst results in relation to the Eurozone? There are many reasons connected with the characteristic of Italian capitalism. I will briefly talk about two of them, only two of them. First of all, Italian capitalism is especially made of medium and small enterprises. In the 90s, these enterprises were competitive and they relied on slow salaries, exploitation of irregular workers, above all migrants, tax evasion and the demand from the international market of low level of goods. Uh, Germany, for instance, was really worked a lot with the North has in Italy. This could guarantee profit for Italian small bourgeoisie and discourage capital concentration. And it also prevented from investing in research and information, enterprise productivity, high level manufacture. When the crisis broke out, in order to cut out costs, multinationals started searching for new supplies in Eastern Europe and China, while small enterprises could no longer be a competition, debts they had with banks, etc. Italian firms reacted to this situation with closing, sacking, selling or increasing exploitation of both workers and the so-called freelance workers. That is, in Italy, they are proletarians, I mean, even if from a status so low, they are freelance workers. This obviously caused a great social breach. Secondly, second <coughs> characteristic of Italian capitalism, Italy has a very high state debt, grown during the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, in order to guarantee social peace in a moment when class struggle was very strong in Italy, but without moving profits, without attacking profits of the ruling class. When the crisis arrived, Italian debt was exposed to speculative attacks. And you can see the figure below by Eurostat, it's very, it's very clear what happened with the debt in Italy. The consequence of this was austerity, cuts on public services, decrease in state expense. These measures had a big impact on working class and poorer people. And if this happened on one side, on the other side, Italian political system lived on privilege and was seen as very distant from the people, where the governors come from political parties, which were already hated by the people, really, and hate against the party, or they were technicians or professors, like Monti. The combination of massive unemployment and high rates of temporary jobs, along with cuts on social services, was phenomenal. The economic and political crisis and the lack of answers brought to a great increase in social discontent in a country with many pre-existing problems, like uh, the gap between north and south or between cities and some product districts and abandoned suburban areas. Who actually had the power over these years? That's the point. In the first place, Italy, as you know, was governed by Berlusconi who was actually left out through some political tactics during the crisis. It was Draghi to push Berlusconi out. So in the 2011, Mario Monti arrived. He was a technician from the International Monetary Fund and who was supported by almost all political forces. Almost. It, it, it means even, even the, the left wing of the parliament. And then, from the 2013 to 2018, there has been the Democratic Party. These governments had a lot in common, anti-popular policies, and they were bank and firm driven. Especially the Democratic Party, a former leftist party, had be, has been responsible for this impoverishment. Such a thing damaged the whole Italian left. In this scenario, with no radical left parties in Parliament that could bring another point of view, the Five Star Movement writes, the, they present themselves as beyond left and right, as you know, and they succeed in becoming the voice of social discontent, as well as acquiring the result of students and union struggles of the period 2008-2011. So, in 2015, they reached 25% of votes at national election. Even in Italy, just like in other European countries, there were actually social movements. 
the old left-wing representatives thought they were, were not able to intercept them. That was the problem. The Democratic Party could not, because it already became a part of the system and it represented the elites. While the other leftist organizations, uh, such as union and parties, did not do this because a lot of reason, but they had already betrayed leftist ideals when they had been in government. They were old, slow, concentrated on election, above all, and leadership. The problem of leadership has been really hard in Italy for a long time, the leadership of the left rather than on building an organization that could serve people. Even when L'Alto Europa with Tsipras succeed in having three members in the European Parliament in the 2014, it was a big victory because we came from six years that there was no election for the radical left in the institution. It did not go beyond this electoral result. Two or three abandoned this project which did not continue, even if many of the smaller parties who were part of the alliance pushed, stated they want to build a new political movement. That was another occasion that we failed. Social movements, on the other side, were not able to produce, to produce much, partly because of an anti-part political education, partly due to the strength that traditional organization, above all the unions, still had. This closed any political space and opportunity to elaborate an innovative political proposal. If radical left was disappearing in all of these forms, independent, the autonomy, currents, the communists, the social democratic, in 2013 and 2014, Five Star Movements, with its presence in Italian Parliament, gets the world scene. The same occurred to the North League, was, was passed, was quickly removed, it was a past made of scandals, etc. In 2013, you have to think, uh, the League achieved only 4% of votes, but it started a very aggressive, aggressive social opposition. It didn't talk to the North anymore, but it addressed the whole country, and they changed the motto from the North first to Italian first. Now, with this kind of strategy, they passed from the 4% in 2015 to the 17% in this election, and now all the polls gave, uh, give them at 30%, 30%. Democratic Party suffered some electoral defeats, but did not modify their strategy. There was no social conflict, since poor classes, labor classes, were threatened by unemployment, and they decided to designate Five Star Movements as the party in charge for solving their problems. So you can see the tragedy, and finally we get to the catastrophe of March the 4th, 2018, the Italian election day. You can see the figure. People, you can see that people lost, totally lost trust in the left, maybe because seen as part of power, or maybe because it is perceived as ineffective and inconsistent. Like Federico said, our people, popular classes, they want to produce some ch changement. And even the, the good leftist party cannot guarantee this kind of changement because they are very inconsistent. We too, of course. And whereas Lega and League and Five Star Movements Ali overcoming some slight differences on a program that provides on, for some social measures, but is especially devoted to protecting small and medium bourgeoisie. As a result, among the others, war among poor people arise in order to exploit more migrant workforce and give symbolic compensation to Italian workforce. In this alliance, Lega, the League, quickly becomes dominant because the proposal of Five Star Movements needs found because are some social proposal and Confindustria, the unions of enterprise, is strongly against founding while the proposal of the League are almost costless in terms of money because it's war against the poor, it's against the, the migrants, it's <clears throat> very, very, very cheap proposal. So, we came to the second part. <laughs> that was the 
the worst part, the, <laughs> the saddest one. Now we start with the positive, I hope. Uh, so, potere al popolo, power to the people as an attempt to answer to this scenario. Because the electoral result was easily predictable since the beginning of 2017. However, none of the existing left forces was able to offer something really different. The leftist part of the PD understood that their party was going to collapse and for this reason it left the party and it founded LEU, which means free and equal, with another social democratic force, Italian left. This new force aimed at gaining consent among the leftist electorate, but this area was not convincing because they wanted to, they hoped of gaining 10% of votes, they, they went just over 3% because people uh, saw them as the, continu the continuity with the Democratic Party. In November 2017, the political scenario presented two big risks. Thousands of leftists and youth votes could go towards five-star movements, or even worse, to right-wing forces and the entire political campaign could have been centred only on rightist topics. This would have produced, the day after voting, a sense of confusion. For this reason, a social centre in Naples, it's, it's like a squat, it's like a people house, so it's a very it's a grassroots movement, whose name is uh, Isopad, so that in Neapolitan means I am crazy, so you can understand. <laughs> Made by about 100 young activists, decided to launch a call to speak out during the campaign. The idea was a little bit unconventional for Italian left. Was if nobody represents us, we will represent ourselves. We want to show another Italy, the part that struggles and is active in solidarity movements, because this part still exists in Italy. There's a lot of grassroots movements in Italy. We want to try to recompose social experiences, not to lose any of them, and give an identity to all. This was necessary to start working again soon after the elections, even if the right would have won, which was very probable. We could start soon after March the 4th because we knew each other during the campaign and we would be ready to build a new political force. It is evident that the point was not unifying the left or having some deputy because it was very, very possible in four months, but starting a grassroots movement on the national level which could involve new people into politics. This idea convinced some communist parties that refusing being part of Leo because of, of its excessive moderation and lack of trust in former Democratic Party members. So, especially the Fondazione Comunista, which is the most important party of this alliance and is one of the, uh, of the only organization of left which still has a, a big force on the in, on the territory, in, in the national level, decided to commit to building this electoral list, which led to acquire a national dimension. In short time, 150 territorial meetings set up, and they, that, that is quite surprising, are still active nowadays, and a good ability of intervention developed. Viola Caracolo was chosen as a spokeswoman, she is 38 years old, woman from Naples, a university researcher working on temporary contracts, and she was an activist of the social center, Isol Paz. The electoral campaign was not easy, of course. The media did not cover us. We had fascist assault, really fascist assault, with knife uh, and all the stuff, chains and so on, police intimidation, and only 80,000 euros to spend on the campaign. Which is, you can imagine it's, it's, it's very few money. On March the 4th, most people had never heard about Potera al Popolo, or they had a completely distorted idea of it. In some places, uh, power to the people was very frightening for the five-star movements, because in that 
places, uh, there was a big competition. So um, five star movements started to say that power to the people was um, a creation of the Democratic Party. That is very funny. But just to understand that in some point uh, we had a really competition with one of the biggest parties now in Italy. Nevertheless, the project obtained 1.2% of votes, about um, 373,000 votes. It's better to say so. A small result, but any type of result was thought to be impossible just a few months early. Although the list did not enter in the parliament, soon after March 4th, the movement continued working, opening people's houses and operating on their territories to speak and know more people. For the first time over the last 12 years, a leftist list, list that ran for election did not dissolve after voting day. What is the activity of the Popolo Bezidon? <laughs> First of all, on solidarity and mutual activities and on settling the territories. Potera Popolo wants to resign the Italian socialist and communist tradition of the houses of people, which were a place where working class could recompose and experiment self-management. Mutual activities are not only a way to fulfill the needs of people, which the state cannot fulfill anymore, we're talking about free health care, free jeans, squatting houses, but they are also a way to learn about working class, stay in touch with it, and teach them to solve problems. It is tactics because it allows to gain consent, but it's also strategic because it prefigures the world to come. Secondly, Potera Popola is at the center of this analysis the conflict between capital and work. For this reason, we allied with the radical union, Unione Sindacale di Base, but also with most radical parts of the CGL, as you know, the biggest Italian union, supporting the struggles in the labor market. It's obvious for a leftist force to do so, but I can assure to you that was not simple in Italy that left does the left. Thirdly, the political axis that Potere al Popolo has at its core is really the redistribution of wealth through, through a fair tax, recognition of fiscal evasion, which in Italy is a very big problem. We're talking about 130 uh, milliard of euros, and a property tax and a struggle against this class struggle that lays out through the tax system. Italy indeed is in the fourth country in the world for private wealth. And however, it still is one of the biggest imperialist countries. The mantra, there is no money, is true only because there is no will to undermine profits and private income. We think that in the last decade, wealth polarized and to guarantee life and make some social progress, it is necessary to retrieve capitals and push public intervention in order to create work and safety services. These are only the main intervention axes Others are possible, like and then environmentalism, anti-sexism, and internationalism are all deeply felt. In this space, though, we want to be more practical than ideological and show people that we can help them and fulfill their needs. For a long time, the left had not been useful for people in Italy, I'm joking, and it had been distant from territories. Instead, we want to settle in territories and stay in touch with our people, because without this mutual relation, there is no right line that people can follow. On May 26th and 27th, the fourth meeting of Potera Popolo was held in Naples, after Rome. Thousands of people participated, and on June, we participated in the first demonstration against the new government. These were two moments that showed the potential of this movement, at least from the point of view of active participation of uh, the activist world. Now, last, last part of my speech, it's about Potera Popol in the forthcoming months, organization, opposition, and European elections. At the present time, surveys the pool as seen, as seen 2.1% uh, of consent to Potera Popolo, a trend that increased over the last weeks. It is clear our project is still very small, very small, both for bearing the impacts of, of these government policies, so to defend us, 
and to be an effective tool for the people, so to negotiate and to go to the counter-attack. How do we think to enlarge our movement? We think there are many ways to do this. I will try to divide this part in three steps, logical but also chronological. First of all, the organizational process. Because uh, what, um, <clears throat> what people always uh, criticize to the left in, in Italy is that there is no way to be part of the decision. Usually in Italy, the, the left, it was probably an heritage of the Communist Party, was uh, not so sensible to, to the problem of real participation. So uh, now we have really a great sensibility about people, who, people leftist people, who think uh, always to be cheated by the, uh, the, the chief of the organization. So we started from the basics and we say, okay, we launch a membership campaign. Membership will allow us to involve more common people and not only activists and militants. It will be also an exposure campaign and we will try to involve thousands of people, I mean, workers above all. They will finally be able to write the chapter vote for the National Commission and the spoken person and vote through an online platform because we don't want to leave the online participation only to the five stars movements. Also because, you know, that kind of participation it's like only like a referendum. It's not about discussion, about going together to the decision. So, uh, it's, it's a very little thing, but to start to talk in, in Italy in, in, in the left world about online participation, it's already a scandal, it's already a, a, good, a good way to go forward. In this way, Potera Popolo will definitely overcome its initial phase and will become a political subject independent from the forces that composed it. Sense of identity will strengthen and the following national commission will be more homogeneous and effective. We need to be very, uh, very quickly in taking the decision. On October 6th and 7th, our constitutive national meeting will be held. So after 11 months, we can finally state the birth of Potera Popolo. The second step, the second way we think to use in order to grow is a mobilization campaign during the autumn in schools, universities, workplaces and streets. At the end of October, the government will be forced to approve, to approve a financial act which will attack working class and the poor. In the same period, the European Central Bank will end its quantitative easing program, which has shielded Italy from speculative attacks, the problem of debt. So, after this, a period of turbulence and suffering is likely to happen. But unlike the past, this time we can face it with a better political tool that is also connected with unions. So that could be a, a very good news for social movements in Italy. We hope to involve during this summer other social and political forces and to develop a harsh conflict in order to unveil the limits of this government and make its action hard to accomplish, pushing it on the social issue it states above all first time movements it wanted to deal with. It's like what Federico said about Pedro Sanchez, we <clears throat> try to attack the league because it's an extreme right wing party, but on five star movements, we try to be more uh, intelligent because there's a lot of people, a lot of work, and a lot of young people that support them for their proposals, social proposals. So we want to push the social, the social proposal on and attack the North League. In fall, using the potential we will have developed after the autumn, we will continue discussing about European elections. We believe that this can be another important moment to prove the effectiveness of our struggle. And finally, we will have an election, not as first step, but uh, like final step of a process of accumulation of forces. Also because Potera Popolo is the only leftist movement with a very critical position on the European Union. We wrote in our program, in our program that we must break the EU treaties because uh, the, the Italian constitution has a level of democracy uh, 
very higher, and uh, we never vote from the this treaty, from the European treaty. So a party was named is Potera Popolo, of course, power to the people. <laughs> of course, we have to point this democratic uh, point, this democratic um, <clears throat> point in the European institution. And since five star movements and league normalize their position about EU, EU, there is a room for who wants to denounce austerity policies, but especially the anti proletarian structure of the EU. At the moment in Italy, like in Europe, the scenario is quite fragmented for I'm talking about European election. There is the movement of our parties, the M25, there is European left, there are positions close to the call and now the people and to mention. All these positions are weak from an electoral point of view in Italy and none of them is able to run alone and gain any members at the European Parliament. In this frame, it seems that Luigi De Magistris, the major of the third, or of the third largest Italian city, which is Naples, is coming forward. He is a leftist populist character, a former magistrate who gained popularity because of his thorny probes and the radical administration of the city. The magistrates, who has relation with Ada Colau and Podemos, but also with Melchon, Cyprus, Fairfax, and so on, wants to federate all the existing left wing movements, excluding, of course, the Democratic Party, and wants to try to gain some electorate of five star movements, especially the parts that oppose the alliance with the League. The project, of course, aims at reaching and overcoming 5-10% to get into European Parliament in Italy, you have to pass the 4%. So, it is not sure that he will succeed in this attempt, since there are many differences in the left family, and the Magistris does not have any needs from an organization point of view, without saying that he is already very busy with the city. What is sure, though, is that Power to the people will decide its collocation in this scenario with its members. We will not decide from the height. We are starting a campaign of discussion with our basis when the organization process will be complete. In any case, in the worst case scenario, we're not afraid of running alone. But at the same time, we are following the steps of the magistrates because we are aware that people in our country need a stronger relation between people's organization and radical left representatives in the European Parliament. They need to think that what they are voting is useful to change their situation and we cannot uh, leave uh, the space of opposition to the right-wing party, as Federico said. So we think that if we cooperate with other European organizations, we could do many useful things, of course, struggle against production of shoring, exporting capitals and fiscal paralysis, a struggle to improve European rules of work, and or attack copyright, which is a very important question. Now, in conclusion, I try to sum up the features of our project in the very difficult Italian scenario. Of course, I could not talk about everything, even if I already said too much, and I thank you for your attention. I want to finish with one more thing about our, our uh, spirit in doing this kind of craziness, this adventure. Although, because, you know, we're not uh, professional politics, I mean, so it was really craziness. Although it, it could seem strange, we are not living this moment in Italy as a, as a defeat. We feel more like a group of hungry conquerors of the future, more than a nostalgic haze of the past. By the way, class struggle in our country is made of progress and retreats, always been like this. Now we are in a phase of retreat, but history we already see in moments like this. These phases too are helpful to clarify, to select, and to offer the opportunity to inquire, to imagine, to reach some contact with the best part of society. If we walk this way, the progress phase will start very soon. 
who knows, maybe next year, at the next Transform Seminar, we might be talking about our victories. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> Thank you.